Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out on a wet, cold evening uh, to listen to a, an amazing presentation that we have tonight on uh, leisure in 18th century Istanbul. Uh, my name is Jim Ryan. I'm the associate director of the Kevorkian Center here at NYU. Uh, we're co-sponsors on tonight for tonight's, tonight's event. Uh, and so on uh, behalf of NYU Abu Dhabi and the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute, as well as the Ottoman and Turkish Studies series, which is, uh, co uh, is curated by Aisha Baltajoğlu Brammer. Uh, I want to uh, welcome you all and, and thank our co-sponsors and hosts. Uh, and I also, before I uh, introduce our two speakers tonight, I want to point out that uh, each of the seats should have a sheet of music uh, that is, if you're curious, going to be referenced uh, in the course of uh, our presentation tonight. Um, I wanted to check for, uh, Harun, are you going to speak first? OK, all right. So I'll introduce Harun Kuchuk first. Uh, Harun Kuchuk is assistant professor of history and, si and sociology of science at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, his work explores the relationship between daily practices and science in Ottoman Istanbul. Kuchuk received his PhD and uh, his PhD from the University of California, San Diego, and has previously held pre- and postdoctoral fellowships at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science. His first book, Science Without Leisure. Uh, Practical Naturalism in Istanbul from 1660 to 1732 will be published by the University of Pittsburgh Press in 2019. Keep an eye out for that. Hopefully in bookstores mostly everywhere. <laughs> um, and uh, following Harun's uh, presentation, we're going to have a presentation from uh, Walter Feldman. Uh, Walter Zeb Feldman is a, uh, currently a senior research fellow affiliated with New York University in Abu Dhabi and is a leading researcher in both Ottoman, Turkish, and Jewish music. Uh, during the 1970s, he spearheaded the revival of klezmer music. He is today a performer of traditional klezmer dulcimer, the cymbal, uh, the Ottoman lute, the tanbur, uh, and has published two books, uh, or at least two books that are listed in my <laughs> cheat sheet here. Uh, first, uh, The Music of the Ottoman Court, Makam, Composition, and the Early Ottoman Instr Instrumental Repertoire. Uh, and a book on klezmer, subtitled Music, History, and Memory, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2016. Uh, Walter has also worked uh, very closely with uh, the Mevlevi Dervishes on a UNESCO project in 2004, uh, and is currently researching a book on the music of the Mevlevi for the Aga Khan University. And in 2018, which is a, a, an event that he uh, coordinated uh, at the uh, at NYU Abu Dhabi, and part of the reason we have uh, this uh, wonderful event with us tonight, he coordinated a workshop uh, entitled "A Locally Generated Mo Modernity: The Ottoman Empire in the Long 18th Century." So, without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Harun Kuchuk and Walter Feldman. Well, thank you for showing up. Um, I was afraid this was going to be a crickets kind of event, but uh, I mean, the room is more full than, I, you know, that I, than I've ever seen. Um, so um, tonight, the, the subject is leisure. Um, it might appear as a you know, whimsical or um, you know, just uh, luxurious and unnecessary concept because leisure um, doesn't really have a place either in um, historiography nor does it have a place in, um, in social science, except as some other concept that's associated with leisure, but you know, I'll try to explain that's really not leisure. So um, beginning with Peter Burke, um, Social historians have discussed um, this notion of free time and you know, ent you know, entertaining oneself in, fr um, in this free time um, that evolved over the early modern period. Um, but that's really not uh, what I'm going to talk about today. And um, I just want to tell you a little about you know, how I got to think about leisure. Um, I'm a historian of science, um, so I look at scientific texts and um, the scientific texts in Ottoman Istanbul just seemed weird, um, inexplicable, because there are certain narrative structures that you find. So um, you know, one way that this is usually understood is 
you have Islamic science, no, 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 and then you have Western science. And I'm looking at this no, 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 no period where it doesn't seem to be either particularly Islamic or particularly Western. It attaches to what um, great French historian Fernand Brodel would call um, material life, right? So it's very close to, you know, um, food and shelter and health and consumption and things like that. So what does this mean in practice? It means that, you know, most astronomical works that you will find in 17th century Istanbul are going to be almanacs. Um, and for those of you who don't know, you know, almanac is basically, you know, in the early modern period, no such thing as a pure calendar. You get an almanac that has, you know, your calendar information. It also has some astrology, um, weather information, right? So today you can go buy the farmer's almanac at Barnes and Noble. You know, literally, it's a genre that's still with us today. Um, other than that, you find manuals for using um, fairly simple astronomical instruments. And you find uh, just a staggering amount of drug recipes. So it's all drugs and nothing but drugs when it comes to medicine. And when it comes to things like physics, it's usually about physics and alchemy. I'll group those together just for the purpose of this talk. It's basically about you know, how to work with precious stones, um, how to make gold, and, you know, but real gold, not you know, the, the pursuit of that philosopher's stone or gold. But really, you, know, you get a nugget of gold. Now, how do you make this into like a coin or something? Right? That's, um, those are the kinds of things that you find. And you find a lot of these. Right, so the, I didn't really have any narrative models that gave me an explanation for why this was the case. No one was narrating this story, so you know um, that's another part of the problem. Um, I mean, in hindsight, people talk about it, but during the period, nobody tells me why somebody wasn't doing theoretical astronomy. Right? I mean, you know. Ptolemy, Copernicus, Kepler, that register of activity, or why no one was doing physics. So nobody told me you know, why that was the case. And the general sort of um, a priori kind of like ready-made narratives really didn't fit. So I embarked on a what one may call a revisionist trip, um, following actually Rifat Ebu El Hajj, who's here. He's probably the first person to really take a stab at this weirdness of the 17th century. Um, and I'm just bringing in something that seems gratuitous, but I hope by the end of this evening, you will feel it's not so gratuitous <laughs> after all. So um, what do I mean by leisure? Um, so the word that you will find in Ottoman Turkish is rahat. And this corresponds almost exactly to what um, a Stoic would call otium, like Seneca would call otium, uh, or what Aristotle in his Nicomachean Ethics called skole. Um, so you know, just something that you may already know, skole is um, where the word school comes from. Right? So think of leisure like that. So this isn't like travel and leisure. This isn't about, you know, uh, 2004 Dom Perignon, and you know it's not that kind of leisure. This is a completely different sort of thing, and um, and when coming into this, when I guess like reading into this, I mean I didn't just um, sort of it didn't dawn on me just by looking at the sources that you know this would be the most obvious thing. Um, it took place through like a fairly long process of elimination, and I feel like I should say the. What enlightened me most in this voyage was um, this man, Pierre Bourdieu, um, who actually wrote an entire book on leisure. And uh, it launched um, a field called leisure studies. Um, I don't know how active it is anymore, but you know, there were journals of leisure studies for a long time. And this is how he defines leisure. Leisure is the fact of being detached for a more or less long time from work and the world of work from serious activity sanctioned by monetary compensation or more generally of being more or less completely exempted from all the negative experiences associated with privation or uncertainty about the morrow. Right? So it's a very internal kind of experience. So you can feel at leisure um, when certain material things are in, at place, and this is different for everyone. You know, the one example that I kind of like to think of, um, when you think of someone like Galileo, um, 
So Galileo uh, and Newton made about the same amount of money, um, you know, adjusted for inflation. Uh, but Galileo had three kids, um, so you know, as soon as he got a teaching job, he took to inventing and like you know, selling instruments, etc. Whereas Newton pretty much did nothing that made him money for 20 years. He had this small Cambridge apartment, and then he just lived there and didn't even write anything for 20 years. And then he came up with um, the Principia, which is the foundation of Newtonian physics. So you know, it just the, that feeling um, changes. You know, the material conditions that you need for that feeling changes. Uh, but definitely, you know, if you are um, facing mortal threats and are very poor and are facing starvation, you definitely don't feel at leisure, right? So think of it that way. Um, and, uh, and I took Bourdieu's work and then I started looking for, well, you know, is, is anybody thinking about this in the Ottoman Empire? And it turns out that not, not only was everybody thinking about it, everybody was writing about it. It's just right there, uh, but you wouldn't see it or think about it if you didn't believe it, because I think when people say leisure, um, it doesn't really tend to be taken very seriously. I definitely didn't take it seriously for 10 years. Um, and this is particularly important for science, because um, you know what you find in the Nicomachean Ethics, uh, which I would consider one of the earliest sort of social reflections on the necessary conditions for science. You know, uh, Arist Aristotle clearly says, you know, if you want contemplation, which is the same word as theory, uh, what you need is, well, you need some money, you need some good friends, you need stability, um, and you need time, right? The, this is like how science comes about. And the 17th century is when you did not have this in Istanbul. Um, now, People remark on the absence of leisure um, in the 17th century. There is this poet, Nabi, especially, you know, this Hayriye is almost entirely about how non-leisured everybody is. And what's the story there? So let me give you a sense of what um, this Ottoman poet who kind of lived in mostly in the 17th century, but also a little bit in the 18th century, how he complained about society. So, what happens when leisure disappears? And you know, how does leisure disappear? Well, first of all, you know, um, if you don't have time, right, that's, you don't get leisure. If you're poor, you don't get leisure. If you are at risk, you don't get leisure. And how do you respond to it? Right? So that's kind of what Nabi was talking about. So he was saying, look, you know, I go to a physician. I don't even know if he's a physician or not. He's trying to sell me a drug. I don't even know if this is a tested drug or whether it's an experimental drug. He's just trying to sell me a drug. I go to an astrologer. I don't know if, he, if he's lying. I don't know if he has any training whatsoever. Um, he says, you know, you go to the judge and be, ju the judge is poor. He wants bribes. So you don't know if, he, if you're going to get justice. You know, you go to a scholar. You don't even know, you know, what these scholars know. I mean, it's, so this is kind of, you know, how things become, right? So everybody's trying to stay afloat. Everybody's trying to stay alive. And um, it is precisely this environment that doesn't allow for leisure. And there are lots of reasons. You know, I have a fairly convoluted, I guess, um, explanation for this that has to do with inflation, which I will not bother you with. But you know, hyperinflation, um, and I would say you know, in this regard, um, so Weimar cultural history is 1920s has some resemblance to Ottoman history in the, in the late 16th century. But I'll be happy to you know, answer any questions you may have. Um, so I'm looking at the happy side of the picture, which is the return of leisure to Istanbul. You know, that's the 18th century story. And um, how does this happen? Um, a number of things are you know, sort of line up. Uh, first of all, you know, there is uh, you know, peace, some peace. Um, short-lived, but some peace, at least peace um, from the perspective of Istanbul. Um, that is, you know, war isn't part of daily life, which isn't the case in the 17th century, because, you know, in the 17th century, the Venetians almost get all the way to Istanbul. You know, they cause a big famine, prices go up, and uh, and the bread becomes, you know, twice what you make in a day, and, and things like that. Um, but, you know, when it comes back, it's partly peace, 
partly stability, so the end of inflation, beginning of the 18th century. Because you know, one thing that happens in the 17th century, or at least in the 16th century, is you know, wages remain nominally the same, but the value you know, drops. So your buying power suddenly you know, goes down to one tenth. And this keeps like dropping little by little, like you know, much over much of the 17th century. It's only in the 18th century that you have a stable currency, right? And I think you know, looking at Venezuela and a, and a bunch of other places today, Turkey, um, we get a sense of what's how deleterious just simple inflation can be for everything, right? It just like erodes away um, um, a lot of the things that we take for granted. Um, so Nabi. Um, said, OK, um, if everybody's a huckster and a, a kind of like you know, trying to cheat me out of my money or my life or my land or something, um, there has to be something that's good. And this is him, and um, kind of like an interesting thing. Um, he's a deliberately middle class person. right? This is um, a fairly interesting phenomenon, I think. So middle class people, uh, which all of these um, people that I'm going to talk about, or upper middle class people, which is you know, everybody that I'm going to talk about, um, don't want to get very high office. So these aren't people who are just trying to become very wealthy, uh, but fail to do so. These are people who consciously abstain from high office and high profits, because they know that you know, there is a certain point at which lives become unstable. So they want something that's comfortable and stable and uh, has something to do with, well, you know, just leading a life of leisure. And Nabi is um, generally considered the, the main or the first poet to come up with the idea. And the job that he finds is becoming an advisor to the Imperial Council. And he says this, I have never seen in our state anyone with more leisure than the Hajjes, which is you know, sort of the, the name for the advisors. They possess reason and skill and science. They have manners and free time and calm. Their skills have purpose, covered in purity and beauty in all directions. Right. So this is, I would say, a fairly full picture of what leisure looks like. And Nabi is saying, you know, you can find it if you become an advisor to the Imperial Council. And lo and behold, actually, you know, when you know, we talk about the 18th century, especially intellectual life in the 18th century. Um, everybody seems to be an advisor to the council. That's the job you want if you want to do science or you know intellectual things. So um, I'll just name a few few people just to I guess show that I have done my work. Um, so Ottoman, you know, historian Naima, he is a hoja of the divan. Ibrahim Muteferika, he is a hoja of the divan. Um, Yirmisek is Mehmet Celebi. Um, Salim, Rashid, I just everybody that you probably know from the 18th century, if you know anything about the 18th century Istanbul, they are all advisors to the Imperial Council. Um, that's kind of the thing to do, and that's what provides leisure, which is why you know these people are you know writing poems and theoretical treatises and things of that sort. So things are changing uh, with the emergence of this middle class, which has not to do with kind of like capitalism and wealth, but this conscious um, sort of desire to find something that's comfortable and stable, but will not give you a tremendous amount of money necessarily. Um, and poets, right? So when you start digging for leisure, it just seems to pop up everywhere. And um, the 18th century, this is the Ottoman Sultan Ahmed III behind in the picture are Ahmedian coins, which are sort of partly responsible for stabilizing the currency. Um, and they are all talking about leisure. So um, he, you know, Nedim says, for he is the sultan in whom religion seeks refuge, who does not feel at leisure in his reign. Salim, you have never rested in the orchard that is the world. Bliss is not in fortune, but in leisure. Our contemporaries and, and Vehbi, our contemporaries enjoy leisure because of him. The entire world is at peace under his protection, right? Um, and of course, you know there is nothing unusual about a court poet praising a sultan. What is, however, strange is that they are all talking about leisure or rahat, and um, and I guess you know there are you know you will find traces of this in the 17th century. There's, since there is like not much leisure, you it will be much rarer. So for example, someone like Katip Celebi, who's 
probably the most famous 17th century figure in, in Ottoman history. He talks about, you know, again, things that sounded so weird to me, but make sense now. He says at some point, you know, studying geography is like resting on four pillows. Um, I never thought of geography as kind of like a pillowy sort of experience. But he's saying, look, you know, if you just sit down with an atlas, look at the maps, there is something that this does for you. And this is different from geography that you might do in the battlefield, right? So, you know, it's studying an atlas is different from looking at a map when you are entering battle. It's also different from um, drawing a map for cadastral reasons, right? So there is a leisure register of activity that, you know, Katip Celebi is talking about. And of course, Katip Celebi is very extraordinary for his period. He's got two inheritances under his belt and possibly the largest library in the city of Istanbul. So of course, he will talk about leisure. You know, he's, he is at leisure. Um, and one of the things is, of course, you know, just as 17th century focus on practical things is not unique to um, the Muslims. So you know, you'll find everybody is doing the same thing. So it's not like there is some um, secret um, Greek or Jewish or Armenian culture of leisure that's really not popping up. Um, it's rather that you know, everybody is pretty much in the same boat. And in the 18th century, when leisure returns, it returns to everyone also. And to that end, I will just speak a little about Nicholas Mavro Cordato and uh, Dimitri Kantemir. And Dimitri Kantemir will be the segue to uh, Professor Feldman's talk. So again, one of the things that you find in the 18th century, um, you know, the way we usually think about it is modernity. Right? Modernity, uh, people are just coming up with new things and you know, just a new world is dawning. That's actually not the case at all because you know, in the 17th century, everything is already new. So um, almanacs are new, recipes are new, um, new instruments, new everything. What happens in the 18th century is they are kind of like taking a step back. They are actually saying, you know what, it would be nice if somebody starts reading books instead of trying to you know, sell me things or trying to like, provide services. So you have this interesting phenomenon in the 18th century where these people are kind of trying to distance themselves from this material life that has dominated everything. And, um, and I guess, you know, not to sound confusing, but 17th century to me um, sounds like you know, what I fear neoliberalism will be like. You know, every piece of knowledge will be reduced to its use value. Um, no one will sort of like pursue knowledge for knowledge's sake, right? Um, so, you know, doctors will become actually people who just sell me drugs and do nothing else. And, you know, everybody is trying to sell me something, make money off of me. And there is like, you know, that's all that there is to science, philosophy, art, everything, right? So that's kind of what I'm afraid of. And I think that was the experience of the 17th century. So in the 18th century, people are saying, I'm going to shut the door. I'm going to read some books. Um, I don't want to be the governor of Bosnia, right? That's kind of how they are going to be living. And, uh, and Mavra Cordato is an ex excellent example of this. Again, um, major bibliophile, has a giant library. Um, is named prince, so he's not a hereditary prince. He is made prince by Sultan Ahmed III. And when you look at Mavro Cordato's writings, and he's quite familiar with you know, what's happening in Europe, well, he, what he picks up on isn't you know, all this like, new science and philosophy, etc. He picks up on the fact that you know, people read books over in Europe. They have books over in Europe. Um, and this is how he starts his book. It's, uh, he's got this uh, you know, major work called Philotio. Uh, Pararga, and for Greek speakers among you, that means um, uh, the leisure hours of uh, the God-loving man. And he says, I pray that the reader who takes this book in his hand, written as it came to me, look not for some sublime thoughts. I wrote this at leisure hours when I was away from books, but they enjoyed excellent company. Greece is no longer completely dispossessed of learned men and books. She at least guards the relics of her ancient grandeur, over the years, excellent scholars in all fields have returned from the illustrious academies of Rome and Padua. They enriched their nation in both foreign knowledge and Greek philosophy, especially now. Some among them read the writings of ancient Greeks and all that is worth reading in Latin, Arabic, Persian, Italian, and French. 
They apply themselves to their studies and ceaselessly they read day and night. So this isn't really the image of a, you know, uh, a super innovator you have here. This sounds like, you know, um, how my mother would have liked me to be, you know, when I was kind of like a student, right? This reads like that, you know, they, oh, you know, so such a hardworking student, you know, reading all these things, just massive erudition, book knowledge, etc. Because that's what was new in the 18th century. In the 17th century, um, you didn't have the books, you had all the innovations, but not the book reading. In the 18th century, book reading returns, perspective returns, distance returns, right? So that's another thing about leisure. It's a certain understanding of time, um, which makes a lot of things possible. So, you know, just to give you an example, if um, I had to solve something today, right, I wouldn't go to a scientist. Because the scientist is going to take my problem of today, turn it into a 10-year research project, and give me an abstract answer, right? This is, this is like the unique flavor of science comes from this. So, you know, um, you have a problem with navigation and gunnery, you go to Newton, he writes a book in Latin about celestial mechanics. Or, you know, if, if you want to like a, make a nice light bulb, you go to Max Planck, he gives you Planck's constant in seven years, and then you're like, okay, you know, that, that's a perfect light bulb, right? So there is this distance that comes with leisure that is sort of like essential to theory. It's a temporal regime, as it were. And um, so, you know, something else that might be of interest, so something like um, climate change, right? Climate change is only meaningful if you are thinking within a certain time scale. Uh, if you're not at leisure, you are not thinking about climate change, you're thinking about, let's say, your profits next year, or you know, staying alive, or you know, um, getting more money, or some such, right? You have urgent concerns, you don't think about 30 years, you don't think about 50 years, right? And leisure is what allows you to think in those different time scales, you have a longer sense of the past and a longer sense of the future, and a different sense of the present. So it's the kind of like the opposite of carpe diem, like you know, being at leisure. Um, and finally, um, Dimitri Kantemir. Um, again, you know, when you start looking for leisure, it just pops up everywhere. He has this book called Salvation of the Wise Man and Ruin of the Sinful, Sinful World, where he's basically writing an entire moral treatise about how you should shut yourself in a room um, try to cultivate virtue by reading um, classics, um, classical philosophy and scriptures. And the, the man is a prince, so he doesn't want any part of public life. He doesn't want to profit off of anyone. He doesn't want anyone to profit off of him. And the sort of like the common activities that he and Nabi and everybody else thought you know, was um, very prevalent in Istanbul, you know, um, fornication, playing backgammon, smoking tobacco, drinking alcohol, right? Um, all of these things, he said, look, you know, this is, this is no way to live. You need to um, withdraw yourself from this, this life and, uh, and cultivate leisure, basically, in your private hours. And on that note, I will hand it over to Professor Feldman. <laughs> Now, pardon me from speaking from down here because I have to uh, handle a number of things, including a daira. Um, now, I'm talking about leisure uh, in the uh, music of the Ottoman 18th century. Yes. You, yes, I'm getting closer. Okay. Now, uh, we'll start with Prince uh, Kantemir, in fact. This, in the generation following the groundbreaking book of musical theory, the Kitab Yunu Musiki, or well, the Book of the Science of Music, which uh, Demetrius Kantemir wrote around 1700 or so. This is, by the, I will refer to it again, an extremely important and you, actually unique, uh, uh, let's say, view of the meaning of, and the structure of, this, of the music of the uh, Ottoman court. He himself was a first-rate composer and performer on the tambour, the Ottoman lute. And in his leisure time, in his palace, Right. <laughs> on the water, he had the, the best uh, musicians and composers in Istanbul come to his palace and teach him. 
right, from, from among the Muslims and the Greeks and the Jews. They all came to his palace. And uh, I translated, it's about 30 years ago, I, I translated his book of the science of music into English, which he wrote in Ottoman Turkish. And he was asked by the Ottoman court to please explain our music to us. Because the, the courtiers understood that there was no one in Istanbul who had this both practical knowledge and theoretical understanding. And I also call him the first ethnomusicologist because he simply started by interviewing his teachers. And a few places he has them disagreeing with each other. And he, it's a remarkable book. So, uh, <clears throat> now for him, <clears throat> in his generation and afterwards, the practice and conceptualization of Rahat, of leisure, as a cultural ideal, were enshrined in new developments in the musical form known as the beste, meaning the composition, or murabba beste. By the middle of the 17th century, this vocal form had developed out of the older form, turku murabba, which had been linked to folklore and to minstrel songs, ashuk songs. The older murabba, it said the new development was that the old murabba was combined with the long rhythmic cycle, which are called usul in Turkish, long rhythmic cycles, used in the instrumental music of the Janissary Metalhana, Janissary Orchestra. It produced a vibrant and complex musical genre that came to dominate the Ottoman concert, which was known as the Fasul Majlisi. It is also not accidental that Kantemir employed the word science, ilm, in describing music. However tentative, his book was the first major attempt in post-medieval Ottoman Turkey to reformulate a theory for any Islamic hate artistic reason. He was not content to repeat earlier theoretical works. He attempted to re redefine issues of modality, composition, and improvisation, in keeping with what he saw as the current musical practice of the Ottoman capital. <clears throat> now, within this nexus, music emerges as one of the richest recipients of the fruits of such thought and experimentation due to leisure. The growing urban prosperity and increasing participation of non-Muslims in the secular high culture allowed the Greek furrier guildsman, Zakharia Khanende, who seemed to have died around 1770, to become one of the leading composers for the Ottoman court. We know almost nothing about Zakharia's life, but the furrier's guild was a very powerful and wealthy guild in Istanbul. Now, we'll take as our one musical example his Beste in the Modrast and the rhythmic cycle Aurchember, which I will demonstrate, set to the Ghazel poetry of his Muslim contemporary Nafis, who was almost his exact contemporary. This composition displays the interplay of the long rhythmic cycle, very slow tempo, and highly extended melody. Some of Zakharia's other compositions employ lyrics by the poet and bibliophile Raghib Pasha. There may have been a personal connection through the finale of Ypsilantis Komnenos, who was the Pasha's personal physician. But in the case of Nafis, such a connection is less likely. Nafis was a high-ranking judge in Kadasker, who spent most of his life far from the capital, in Tabriz and Plovdiv and elsewhere. However, between 1753 and 1763, Nafis was the Kadir of Istanbul. So in this case, it's likely that Zaharia's Ras Beste were comp is a composition of the last, most mature phase of his musical career when Nafiz was resident in the capital. Now, I'll say just a word about poetry. I wish I could say more, but there's really no way. Nafiz was an 18th century representative of the so-called Indian style, the Sapki Hindi, of Ottoman poetry, which had its beginnings in the previous century. While in that century, in the 17th century, its practitioners were considered to be revolutionary, and they rarely received encouragement from the Ottoman court. They received rather more from the Mevlevi dervishes. By the middle of the 18th century, a high bureaucrat, such as Nafis, could adopt this style with impunity. This itself was a major cultural change. Uh, I have an article that just came out in the International Journal of Persian Literature last year, which discusses the, 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 the fact of the Indian style of Turkish literature, about which you can read almost nothing. 
but it's probably some of the most important poetry the Turks ever wrote. Very much uh, under the influence of Mughal literature. Now, turning to music, the Venetian Jesuit Gian Battista Todorini wrote in 1787, the majority of upper class and noble Turks take pleasure in music, which, as among the ancient Greeks, is a part of their whole system of education and culture. The, mo the music cultivated today by Greeks in Constantinople, except for the liturgical chant, is entirely Turkish music. Now, this degree of aristocratic and amateur involvement in artistic music had not existed in Turkey from the early 16th until the middle of the 17th century. It had been more widespread in the past, in the 15th century. The musical decline in Turkey was partly linked with the musical dislocations of the 16th century in the newly Shiite south of Iran. Let's say the, this is another topic which I've written about and hope to write more about that uh, the Safavids managed to cripple artistic music in Iran for over a century. And this had a very, very negative effect on music in Istanbul. While the Turkish court did little to support music for over a century, the two Ottoman institutions that preserved and transmitted artistic music were the Mevlevi dervishes and the Janissary Meterhamen. After this long hiatus, a local renaissance ensued during the long 18th century. Muslim aristocrats, bureaucrats, and Mevlevi dervishes were joined by musicians and composers of the urban Greek Orthodox, Armenian, and Jewish communities. The involvement of the Greek church cantors with Ottoman music was particularly influential. This was first studied by Ioannis Zanus in 1990 and was the subject of the talk by the present speaker at the Onassis Center here at NYU in that same year which I then called the Mutual Penetration of Post-Byzantine and Ottoman Music. At the time, I was doing this entirely by intuition. And it's only afterwards that there was some scholarship on the subject. But it's a very, very big topic, this connection of the Greek Orthodox Church and the Ottoman court music. So my, my one and only example today will be Zaharia's Raspeste, <clears throat> which is a great example of this style. Turning to the poetry for a second, uh, it is, again, Nafiz, which uh, is in the very Indian style poetry, which is almost entirely Persian. The first line is, uh, uh, well, in English, I translate it as, her robe is dyed with the hue of the emerald wave. Second line, the crowd on the meadow is burned black from gazing at the cypress of her verdant stature. I like that. Now, the, uh, the for those who understand Persian or Turkish, the first line, Rengi mevji a bizumruten boyandu jamesi. So we have the reng, the color of the wave of the water of emerald. Right? So this is a typical Indian style chain of what we say in Persian, is often. Words that are linked together. <clears throat> Her robe is dyed with the hue of the emerald wave. Now, uh, I can't say more about the poetry, but we'll get into how the music and the poetry will work together. Usul and Tempo. In his book of musical theory, Prince Kantemir refers to a new practice within the usul by noting that certain pieces are meant to be performed at a very slow overall tempo. He devised a separate system of notation for this. The reason is that the meter of the usul in some step, oh, this is his quotation. He says, the reason for this is that the meter of the usul in some sections, is taken very slowly. For vocal music, in later Ottoman Turkish, there was even an expression, aheste beste, as slow as a beste. Elsewhere, in 1722, Prince Kanti wrote about the vocal repertoire, because these usuls are so intricate, the rhythmic cycles are so intricate, those who do not know the meter cannot play the songs at all, even though they were to hear it a thousand times. Now, these long usuls of the beste were independent from poetic meter. Thus, the, the poetry is going to the meter fa ila tun fa ila tun fa ila tun fa ilun. As we see here, reng imavji a bizumru ten boyan de jamese. By the way, you have in your hands, you'll have the, uh, the musical score, which I'll, I'll refer to in a second. 
Now, <clears throat> this, uh, this uh, uh, poetic meter has little bearing on the relation of melody and rhythm in the musical composition. And as uh, the musicologist Bulent Aksoy had stressed, in Ottoman secular vocal music, the melody came first, and then the text was fit over it. Now, I'll show you something about this Rasul. Uh, again, I, I often say that the Ottoman uh, art music is defined not so much by maqam as by usul. Many kinds of music in Turkey use maqams, but only the artistic, muses, artistic music uses the long usuls. So during the 18th century, these usuls, actually according to Professor Owen Wright in London, and I agree with him, between the mid-17th century and the early 19th century, the overall tempo of Ottoman music decreased five times. A piece that would have been at a certain tempo in, the, in 1650 would have been five times slower in 1850. So that has implications, which I'll demonstrate. So in the uh, 17th century, this usul called Chenber, the ring, had 12 beats. Oh, that's what happened. This is the weather. But Istanbul weather is very similar. In Istanbul, we're constantly retuning everything. Now, this is Chenber as it was in the late 17th century, 12 beats. Yes, you hear that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. By Kantemir's time, it was often played as 24. That's to say as... Uh, <clears throat> Now, a generation later, in the highest time, it often went down to <clears throat> 40, 48 beats, with a tempo much, much lower. And uh, I think this is the time where I should play you the recording. This is the Raspeste, as it was recorded by the Enchordas Ensemble from Salonika about 20 years ago. And uh, if you don't you read music, you can look at the score, but one thing that you'll notice uh, is that <clears throat> is that the text is appearing very, very slowly with many, many melismas and very long stretching out of the text. So uh, you'll have, as you'll see, you'll have words like ab, ab, or zum, root, emerald, zum, root, right, which. Uh, uh, and then to stretch it out as long as possible. So let's listen to uh, Drosos from the Encorna Ensemble. Oops. Singing Zahari Afendi. Now, am I in command of this? Uh, where will I find? I see Prince Kantemir. That's a good sign. But, ah, uh, oh, here it is. Okay. okay. So let's hope it's the right volume. I'll just look at those who look at the score. And just get a sense of the tempo, and I'll explain a bit of the of the of the usul afterwards.
apologize for the, for the sound quality of this. Um, now, where are we? I played through half of the composition, the first, what we call the first honor, the first section of the composition. Uh, the only thing technical I'll do with you now is just to give you a sense of what this usul means in terms of a composition like this. <clears throat> when you learn this in the old days in Turkey, you learn this by the teacher striking the thigh with the main beats. So if you look at the notation, uh, it's starting with two units of eight, then a unit of 12, then a unit of 12, then a unit of eight, and in fact, the melody doesn't quite end where it's supposed to. It, it spills into the next unit of eight. So, <clears throat> so you have something like this. <clears throat> Concerts. So Zaharia understood that his patron knew exactly what he was doing because the Sultan would be boom, peg, peg, and he would hear the melody ending in the wrong place and beginning in the wrong place. But rather than throwing Zaharia out of the court, he in fact would give him more reward because this was a very clever and witty way of composing. Okay? <laughs> so. Um, Instead of throwing him out, he did what? He gave him purses of gold because he was doing something clever and witty. Okay, so I'm just making this up, but Zaharia had a, had a quite a comfortable career doing this. So, <clears throat> do we, I close with interpreting. This is one example. It's a metonym to show you the whole movement of the 18th century Ottoman music, which was the most creative period in the whole history of Ottoman Turkish music. No question. Far more creative than the 19th century. In Turkey, they talk more about the 19th century simply because we have more documents. It's closer in time. But in terms of real creativity, it cannot compare to the 18th century. In the 18th century, new and amazing things were happening in every generation. Very, very unexpected things. We're just beginning to get to the bottom of it. I'm, I'm on the board of the Corpus Musicae Tumonicae project, which is uh, 
Professor Ralph Jaeger in the University of Münster has a 12-year project from the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft to finally create editions of Ottoman music using several forms of notation. Islamic notation, the Armenian notation, the Western notation. We haven't even begun to touch the Byzantine notation. That will be another 12-year project if we live to see it. So just interpreting this one piece of Zaharia, we can say there are many levels of complexity. There's a rhythmic melodic level, stretching out an extreme slowness of tempo, allowing for melismatic developments and embellishments. There's a modal melodic complexity, a new freedom and development of musical theses often are permitted to override the rhythmic cycle. Poetic complexity. This is, the text is in a transnational Indo-Turkish style with some Turkish syntax and lexicon within a predominantly Persian linguistic form. Confessional complexity. The Greek Orthodox development of both Byzantine and Islamic musical materials for a predominantly Muslim, but also a trans-confessional Ottoman society. Societal complexity. A new emphasis on rahat, leisure, adds an important element to the musical mixture, together with the mystical languor of more recent developments within Orthodox church music. I'm thinking especially of Petros Berichetis in the late 17th century. So the pieces, in a sense, are both, it's both mystical and secular at the same time. In order to process these distinct complexities, the listener must be at the same time extremely relaxed, but also alert and observant. The slowness of the tempo suggests one mode of being and listening, while the rapidity of certain melodic and rhythmic changes demands another. The listener must take in a very large overarching rhythmic and modal structure, but also occasions where this rhythmic structure is broken. The words of the poetic text will be difficult to decipher as they emerge syllable by syllable with repetitions and very long melismatic phrasing. There will be long sections without any meaningful text at all, called the Terenu, which begins with, uh, let's see. Emrum, <clears throat> my soul. That's not part of the text. It's the Terenu, it's the, the, the textless section, which is just as long as the section with text. So, uh, and the melodic, um, the whole, this whole collection is unique, not closely resembling any musical form, either contemporary or in the recent past. The theses exert an almost absolute dominance over both rhythmic cycle and poetic meter. Thus, this is a highly abstract and independent musical form, transcending language, and is certainly not merely a vehicle for the performance of poetry. I'll give you two views, one modern Turkish and one modern Greek. The Turkish view from Yulmaz Ostuna from 1976. Zaharia's every musical sentence is constructed out of little melodies that combine and pass through one another. The style is heavy, magnificent, and majestic. Every syllable is worked over, and many modulations appear. In his expression, there is both an orthodox mysticism and a worldly fragrance. A modern Greek view by Kyriakos Kalajidis, who's directed this ensemble in Salonika, he writes, the character and style of his whole work, Zaharia's work, manifests a unity, given they are defined by ecclesiastical music. Although he is particularly known for his secular songs, these very songs are determined by his ecclesiastical musical learning. His approach to music tempo, which imprints itself on time values in his musical scores, has much to do with the cultural circumstances of his time. The music pours out note by note at the pace of tears, or like drops from a precious spring. These two modern Turkish and Greek commentators are in remarkable agreement about the musical characteristics of, of Zaharia's oeuvre. Among these characteristics are a confluence of Turkish and post-Byzantine musical concepts with an overall emphasis on slow and heavy tempos, intricate placing of the melodic phrases over the rhythmic cycle, which may be interpreted as both majestic or mystical. 
It would be simplistic to view changes in musical practice as only a reflection of a single factor within society. But the concept of rahat, of leisure, may offer us one significant explanation, among several others, for musical phenomena that came to dominate the Ottoman 18th century. Within these changes, the composer Zaharia Khanende was one of the most eloquent representatives of the new style. What is perhaps most remarkable is that these innovations of the Ottoman Greek composer were accepted on the highest level and came to determine much of the future development of Ottoman music overall. Well,